The grass withers, the flower fades. But the Word of our God stands forever. <clears throat> the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and observe it. We're here this morning to study in the Word. We are studying a new study this morning, although I do have some follow-up uh, verses I want to look at from our anger study, just a few that I wanted to point to in the Proverbs. But we're actually starting a new study today on witnessing. I will tell you that this study is based on material that I have from Evantel. They're an organization that that's what they're all about, is training people as to how to witness. And there's a lot of material in here, and I've taken that material and I've adapted it for this study. Uh, so that's where we're getting the information from primarily is from that Evantel study and then additional things that I'm adding to it and so on. Before we dive into that study, let's take a moment for silent prayer. We do need to make sure that our hearts are prepared for the study of the Word of God. We need to confess sins if necessary in order for us to be filled with the Spirit so that we might be under His teaching ministry. Also, humility is a critical factor in this. If we're not humble, we're not teachable. If I'm not humble, I can't teach you. We all need to be humble. And we also need to quiet our minds from the busyness of life and focus our attention on what it is that the Word is trying to teach us today. Shall we pray? Most gracious and merciful and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've granted us this morning to be able to gather here at the church, to have this fellowship one with another, to have this opportunity to gather together and pray together as we just did, the opportunity to spend this time in your word, that word that's so precious, that nourishes our souls. We thank you for granting us this opportunity. We thank you for all the grace provisions that made this possible. Father, I thank you for how things went yesterday, the blessing of the wedding that took place here at the church yesterday. We lift up before you the marriage. Pray that your hand of blessing would be upon them. We ask that you would continue to bless all of the Christian marriages, in particular the ones within this local church. We thank you that it's an institution that you designed for the entire race, but as believers we can especially, especially uh, shine the light of Jesus Christ through our marriages. So we thank you for that opportunity. We ask that your hand of blessing would be upon that. We ask now that as we take this time and study your word, that you would help us to clearly understand what we're learning. That we take this all in. We would digest it, dwell upon it, and allow it to bear fruit within our lives. We ask this in Jesus Christ's most precious and beautiful name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, I had a, a few things I was going to talk about prior to getting into the witnessing study, um, as I'm given to do. One of them is I wanted to talk about a, a, a just something. I went to lunch this past week with a coworker of mine who's a brother in Christ, and um, and I've had since since he and I have been working together, we've had some tr tremendous fellowship uh, in, at the office and whatnot, and even beyond. And so I've been blessed by that. But he just said something off the, top of it, off the top of his mind that just struck me. And I thought it was something I'd pass along to you. He was talking about how there's churches that are all about doing, but they have no idea what they're doing or why. They're just about doing. He said, and then there's other churches that are about knowing, but they don't really focus on doing, right? And he said, neither one of those is right. You need to have churches where people know so they understand the Word of God, they understand God, they know God, but then they put that into practice in their lives. They do. And what he, I liked what he said. The phrase he said that caught my attention, he says, people have got to get the Word of God out of their head and into their lives. And it just struck me. It really did. And in other words, it's not supposed to just be here. You're supposed to be here and you're supposed to know it. You're supposed to understand the things of the word. You're going to understand biblical principles. You're supposed to understand the concept of the times in which we live and how God expects us to live and all of those kinds of things. But you've got to get it out of here and into your life. And that's where it really, it really becomes transformative is when you're actually living it. Rather than just knowing it, you're living it. But for some reason that struck, in my, struck a chord with me, the idea of get it out of your head and into your life. So I'm encouraging you to do that. The things that you know about God, the things that you know of His Word, 
get it out of here and into your life. It should be an integral part of everything you do. Uh, and so that really struck me. The other thing I wanted to talk about just because of a, a Bible class that we had a couple weeks ago is that this is a church where we're, we, we teach the things of the Word of God and we don't shy, shy away from the whole counsel of the Word. And that means when you say the whole counsel of the Word, that means cover to cover, right? From the very beginning of the Bible all the way to the end, we don't shy away from any of it. And the other thing is we don't shy away from the deep things. And so we had a Bible class a couple of weeks ago where we, we got into some deep things, and we were talking about some of the deeper things of the Scriptures. And I don't, I don't hide that from any of you. I don't save that sort of thing for when I go to the Chafer Conference and then sit around and talk to other pastors about it. To me, if it's, if it's of, of God's Word, even if it's a deep thing, we're going to talk about it here. So sometimes the reason I mention that is what I endeavor to do as your pastor is to feed you spiritually when you come to the church. And so in order to do that, for you to have a, a true spiritual meal, if you will, it needs to be the full thing, right? Soup to nuts, if you want to use that terminology, right? It needs to be the whole thing. If I want to use the biblical language of it, everything from the milk to the meat. You're going to get the milk of the word. You're going to hear the basic things of the, of the scriptures from the pulpit, but you're also going to hear some of the deep things and everything in between. And my encouragement to you is if you walk out of a Bible class going, oh my gosh, that just blew my mind. That was just way over what I can even grasp or understand. That's fine. Because honestly, sometimes that's going to happen to all of us. I mean, I've been, at, I've been at presentations before where somebody was talking about something and I just sat there in my chair going, wow, I never, I mean, just, I need a chance to chew on this, you know? So that, don't, don't ever fret about that sort of thing if you feel like something that happened in the, in the Bible class was something that was way over what you're cap capable of understanding. Because the reality of it is we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be getting fed wherever we are in our spiritual walk. And the truth of the matter is, there are certain concepts for all of us. Everybody in this room, there are certain concepts that are going to make us have that moment where we go, I'm not sure I fully grasped that. I'm not sure I was really capable of fully understanding that. It happens to everybody. The truth of the matter is, if you walk out of every Bible class, if you, I will say this, if you walk out of every single Bible class that you attend and you remember one thing, if either something new you learned or something you were reminded of, that's success. And so if I spent 20 minutes talking about something that you just went, what in the world was the pastor talking about? And yet you walked out of the service and you came away with one thing that really stuck in your mind, that's success. And just remember that we're, we're all continually learning. I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to go into the deep things to try to blow people's minds. I did it because that's where the Holy Spirit was leading me to go. But the reality of it is there are deep things in the scripture. There are deep things. And we all have opportunities to consider those things. So don't let that scare you. That's what I'm getting at. Don't let that kind of thing scare you. Uh, there's, there's, there's all kinds of food. It's like a buffet here, right? There's all kinds of food. And uh, you're going to get something out of the buffet that's going to feed you. So uh, that, that I would encourage you on. Also, I wanted to take a, a second here uh, to look at some verses that as a follow-up to our anger study, um, let's see. This will show you how the Bible, the Bible software I have, it can find every instance of the word anger in just a second. Um, that's, what, that's what we have available to us today. It used to be that was something people had to search for hours and hours on, and now I can just pop it up in one second. Um, I wanted to touch on a few more verses that I didn't look at in Proverbs, and we'll get to our witnessing study here in just a second, but in, in, in anger, Proverbs fifteen eighteen says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. And my point is, we talked about a lot about anger, what it's all about. You know, by the way, given current events, I'll give you an a, a application. This is application of the anger study we just did. You absolutely can have righteous indignation over what has happened to Israel, over what Hamas has done to Israel. We know that's an affront to God. We know that it is. That's absolutely an affront to God. So you can have righteous indignation. Now, it might become sinful anger, but you can certainly, this is, that's an event that you can have righteous indignation about. But what we have here in this verse is 
we didn't, what we really didn't talk a lot about in our anger study is what are some of the, what are some of the things of how we affect other people, right? When we are angry, because we talked a lot about how it affects us and how it, what it looks like and all that kind of thing. But what about how it affects other people? Well, in Proverbs 15, 18, it says, a hot tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. In other words, if we have a calm and peaceful spirit, if we have that peace of God, which surpasses understanding, we will, it will have a calming effect on others. If we are quick to become angry, if we're a hot-tempered person, what is it going to do? It's just going to feed the fire, isn't it? It's going to feed the fire. It's just going to make things worse, which, I mean, I mean, to me, that's what I see a lot of going on in, in Washington, D.C. and other places like that, political hotspots, is that it's just people just keep feeding the fire, right? It's just the fire gets going and they just keep keep feeding the fire. But I wanted to t- point out just a few verses here. I think there's another one. Uh, yeah, here's another one, uh, Proverbs 16, 32. Uh, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. Now, I will say this. How do you think you're going to have control over this? You certainly can't do it in the strength of the flesh. You try to do it in the strength of the flesh, you're not going to win. You might win for a little while, but you're going to ultimately lose. The only way to have this, the only way to have the peace that surpasses understanding, the only way to be someone who's quick to hear and slow to anger and, uh, you know, slow to, slow to speak and slow to anger, the only way you're going to have that is through the strength which God supplies, through what he gives us. So he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. That gives you an idea of how significant this is to God. We should be individuals who are slow to anger. Let me see if I can make this bigger. All right. Oh, of course, it goes right to the end on me there. Hold on. Let me go back. And I think I had one more I was going to touch on. Let's see. Where is it? Well, now I'm not finding it. Okay, that's all right. Um, Proverbs 19, 11. Uh, a man's discretion, this is one I wanted to look at. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. All right, now this, this is the one I wanted to find. So this is the last one we're going to go to, but the idea is here. What is that talking about? Well, actually, it's talking about, it's talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love passage. What does the love passage say? does not take into account a wrong suffered. Idea of overlooking a transgression, right? So maybe somebody really has done something wrong. They really have wronged you. Can we overlook it in love? Are we able to maintain our composure in the midst of a situation like that? Or are we going are, are to just explode and go crazy? That's what we got to remember. And I just wanted to talk about a few of these different things that we didn't bring into the study that kind of enhance what we talked about with anger, that we have an effect on others. We can actually, instead of calming a situation, we can actually cause it to get worse, right? We can cause a whole situation to become worse. It's a, it's a blessing. It's a blessing for us to be able to control our anger. It's, it's pleasing in God's eyes. And the idea that at times, in order to avoid becoming angry, we have to overlook real wrongs that have been done to us. But we can do that in love. Remember, that's what we can do in love. And I could go to a number of different verses, but I really just wanted to highlight those three as a follow-up to our anger study because, you know, it really gives us more information about the idea of anger. Anger is a real problem. As we talked about, it's a problem for everyone. All right, now we're going to get into our witnessing study, a privilege for members of the body of Christ. We should look at it that way. And here's how I, again, I, I look at all of what we have in our Christian lives. God can accomplish every single thing he needs to accomplish without us. It is a privilege that he offers us. It's a privilege and a blessing that he offers us the opportunity to be his fellow workers. So when it comes to witnessing, it's the same concept. He can get the gospel out without us. He can do it. He offers us that privilege and that blessing of the opportunity to be his fellow workers in sharing the gospel with others. That's how we should look at it. That's how we should understand it. Introduction. 
As believers, we need to recognize that one of the greatest privileges is to share the gospel with unbelievers. It's one of the greatest things we've been called to as believers is to be ambassadors for Christ, to share the gospel. Is it easy? I don't think anybody would say yes. I don't even think if you'd have talked to Billy Graham, I don't think he would have said it was easy, right? He was probably one of the most gifted evangelists I've ever seen. Was it easy for him? I don't think so. It was still a challenge because it's, it's one of those things where you, when, you consider the, when you consider the gravity of the situation, this is somebody's eternal life or death that you're talking about here. So it seems like it's, the gravity is pretty serious there, but it's a privilege and we should recognize that we should be thankful for the opportunity to participate in that. The purpose of the study is to help you understand how to recognize an open door for witnessing and how to give the gospel when such a door opens. That's what we're ultimately going to get to. How is it that you can recognize when you have an opportunity to give the gospel? And what is it that you're going to do when that door opens? Right? How is it that we're going to give the gospel when that door opens? As a church, where that we were talking about as individuals there, as a church, we should be an effective witness to our community, which requires that we start off with a burden for unbelievers. Do you have a burden for unbelievers? Are you, are you concerned about those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Are you thinking in terms of, well, boy, what if the rapture happened today? Where would they be, those who are left behind? What would life be like for them in the turmoil that ensues? And what if they, had, what if they were here and they lived through the tribulation? Have you ever read about the tribulation? <laughs> it's pretty bad. So, you know, do we have a burden for them? Do you think about so... You know, do you have, I've got a good friend. He's the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. Uh, he's an unbeliever. If he were to die today, he would not go to heaven. That's a burden for me. That's a burden. I hope you have a burden for unbelievers. That we have been trained to talk to others about Jesus Christ. If you really look at the gifts, if you really looked at the gifts, if you talk about the, evang- the gift of evangelism, It's a gift that's described as being given to equip the saints. So the gift of evangelism is not a gift specifically to be able to give the gospel. The gift of evangelism is a gift that's given to be able to train or equip the saints to be able to give the gospel. That's an important thing to understand. Somebody who's a gifted evangelist is somebody who's able not only to give the gospel, but to train others and the idea is that we need to be able to understand how can we, we can talk to others about Jesus Christ. As a baby believer, you might have had an idea how to do it because somebody just gave you the gospel. And so if you encountered a situation where you were going to give the gospel to somebody else, you might say, well, that's how that person did it. I'm going to do it the same way. And that's not a bad approach, by the way, because what happened? You got saved. But the reality of it is, if, I asked, if I, we were to go around the room right now and we, and we were to talk to each of you individually, which I'm not going to do, I think we would find out a lot of us don't really have a plan. If that moment happened and we had the opportunity to give the gospel, we wouldn't have a plan. And what I don't mean, I don't mean you can do it the same way every time. We're going to talk about that. Having an idea of how you want to give the gospel doesn't mean that you say, okay, wait a minute, I got a chance to give the gospel. Let me get my paper out. Okay. A. A.1 right? And you go through your list of things. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. What it is, is you have preparation. You've been prepared and you have an idea of how to give the gospel and you're ready to adapt to whatever the situation is, whatever the person that you're talking to needs to hear. Because it's going to be different every time you get the gospel, every time. That we recognize Bible study is not an end in itself, but a means to serve God more effectively. Let me repeat that one. That we recognize Bible study is not an end in itself, but a means to serve God more effectively. The reason we do what we're doing right now, the reason why we have Bible studies, the reason we learn the Word of God is because it helps us to know God and to serve Him more effectively. The end goal is not to go and be in Bible study. The end is to be in Bible study so that you can then serve God. Does that make sense? I hope you understand that. All right. This background, we're not, we're not actually going to turn to Genesis 3, but we're going to talk about it. Why does the world need to hear the gospel message in the first place? Well, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating the forbidden fruit, which everybody thinks of it as an apple, but the Bible doesn't say that. 
the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, their sin adversely affected the entirety of creation. We were just talking about that in Galatians. Their sin severed man's relationship with God. I mean, the entirety of the Adamic race, bam, we were all severed, all of us. By the way, you sinned, when, you sinned in Adam. All of us did. We all effectively sinned in Adam. You're, we are all guilty of the Adamic sin is one way to look at it because we're all descendants of Adam. We're all guilty. It severed that relationship. The only remedy is a personal decision to trust in the finished work, excuse me, to trust that the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross satisfied the righteousness of God. In other words, God is righteous. How righteous is he? Absolutely righteous, infinitely righteous. When the fall took place, his righteousness was in effect offended. I mean, use that word. It was offended. It was breached, right? His righteousness was breached. They committed an act of unrighteousness in eating of the fruit. And he had already told them what the consequence was going to be. And a righteous God cannot just, we're going to talk about it in a minute, a righteous God cannot just say, oh, well, don't worry about it. He can't do that. If he does that, he's not himself anymore. The nature of sin. First of all, sin is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. I don't know if you've noticed that. Beginning in Genesis 3, people have ever struggled with sin and separation from God. It it starts right there in in chapter 3. The problem of sin is a universal problem. We know about that, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's universal. The entirety of the Adamic race. And we are all accountable to the Lord for our sin. Psalm 51.4, David says here, Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now, there's an important concept here. Our sin, the missing of the mark, the hamartia, the missing of the mark in sin, it's against God and His righteousness. Does it affect other people? A lot of times, yes. Don't get the impression from this verse that, and I've heard this, by the way. That's why I'm emphasizing this. I've heard this before. Well, my sin was against God. I've already confessed it, and that's been forgiven, so I don't have to worry about the people that were affected by my sin because my sin was against God, not against them. Well, okay, how's your marriage doing? (laughs) <laughs> right? Because if, if you as a spouse, you think you're, you, that you've done something egregious against your spouse and you say to your spouse, well, my sin was against God, not you, I don't think that's going to play very well, is it? The reality of it is our sin has an effect on people, has an effect on those around us, but ultimately the sin itself, this is what this verse is saying, the sin itself is against God. I, and, and it says, I've done what's evil in your sight so that you are justified. That's the righteousness of God. You're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. So we are accountable. All of us, by the way, even the people that don't believe in God. The people that don't believe in God, they're still accountable to God. All of us are. Our sins are well known by both us and God himself, right? We know and he knows Isaiah 59, 12, for our transgressions are multiplied before you and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us and we know our iniquities. So in other words, our sins testify against us before God. They're multiplied before him. But we know our iniquities. Right? We know. That's the truth. They're well known. Of course, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. You all know this. I'm Preach into the choir here a little bit. 1 Peter 3.18, since Christ also suffered as a sacrifice for sins once and for all, a righteous one in place of unrighteous ones, so that he might bring you to God on the one hand, having been put to death in the flesh, on the other hand, made alive by the Spirit. And it goes on from there. But he was our substitute in place of, that's what that language is right there in 1 Peter 3.18, our substitute in place of us. He was the sacrifice for our sins. That's critical in giving the gospel to understand that. As I said before, God cannot just excuse even the smallest sin. This is, 
This is an important thing in, this, in these two points here. So even the smallest sin, and I say that kind of, and that's quotes around that on purpose, the smallest and biggest, because what makes a sin small? It's just small in our eyes. Because remember, even, even whatever, whatever sin you deem to be small, that sin all by itself would have been enough to put Jesus Christ on the cross. Think about that. That's how big it is. But in your eyes, we, that's why I put quotes around it, because you might say, oh, well, this is just a little thing. No, it's a white lie, you know, or whatever. We have all kinds of terms we use. But what we might look at as a small sin, God can't just excuse that. He can't just say, oh, well, don't worry about it. That's no big deal. Yeah, don't sweat it. It's not a problem. He cannot do that in his holiness. He would not be the holy God that he is if he did that. One second. Sins must be either punished or pardoned. That's it. That's the only two options. Yes, sir. Yeah, we got, yeah. Catholic Church has the mortal sins and the venial sins. They have, the, they have the, the range of sins defined and, you know, it's all that sort of thing. Well, you know what? Uh, I think Paul said, I think it was Paul that said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all sin is utterly sinful. <laughs> all right. Now, this is what, this is the, the other part of it, though, that's important in giving the gospel. Through the finished work of Christ on the cross, God can forgive even the biggest sin. This was a conversation I was having just yesterday at the reception with, I think, Charles. Is that who I was talking to? Is that his name? Was Ch- Charles? Charles? Chuck. Chuck? Okay. Well, that's Ch- Charles. Yeah. <laughs> so I was talking to Chuck there at dinner when we were having dinner, and he was talking about in his own witnessing, one of the things that he has, is, has struggled with is the idea that some people think that They've done stuff that's just too much. There's no way. There's no way that God can forgive that and that they can be saved. Yeah, well, the thief on the cross. God, but think about, but I want you to think about even, I mean, think about Paul, the Apostle Paul, what we consider to be one of the greatest writers of our New Testament scriptures. He was horrific. (laughs) He was horrific. He was not, I mean, the, the, the best he did was put Christians in jail. Right beyond that, the, he was there and witnessed the stoning of Stephen. He was participants in the killing of Christians. Here's somebody, if, if anybody had, a, if anybody had a, a, a right, if you will, to say, I am not worthy of salvation, it would be the Apostle Paul. And yet not only did he get saved, he became an amazing uh, servant of the Lord. Nobody is beyond salvation. And that's why this point is, is important. Some people are going to think they are. They're going to think that they've done things that are just unforgivable. There's no way God can forgive them. But what Christ did on the cross makes it all forgivable. That's what we got to remember. I mean, can you imagine what he went through on the cross? Can can you imagine what that was like? What about the Great Commission? We all know about the Great Commission, right? Jesus gave his disciples the commission to make disciples of others. Uh, I'm going to read the whole thing here in the two verses here. Go, therefore, it really should be translated as you go, or therefore, as you go, which really puts in the mind of as you go, wherever you go. That's how this should be translated. As you go, wherever you go, make disciples of all the nations, all the peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Does this mean that we're just supposed to go out and give people the gospel and, oh, they say they believe? Okay, good. See you later. (laughs) That's not what it says. It says make disciples. A disciple is a... uh, The two words that I like to use that are the equivalent words are a follower, a follower of Christ, a student. Those are the two words that go with the disciple. Somebody who's a student of Christ, a student of the word. So that's what we're supposed to make. And that's why I have so much respect for the way that Billy Graham did all of his revivals. When he would go into a town, he would go, before he would go, his people would get together and they would find local churches, local churches that were good, solid teaching local churches. And the pastors and some of the other representatives, deacons and whatnot from those local churches were there. And so when someone came to faith in Christ at one of those uh, revivals that he would hold, one of the big revivals he would hold, they would be introduced to the leaders of the local churches so that they could find a local church and be fed because he didn't want to just get them saved. 
He wanted them to be able to go somewhere and to grow in the faith. He wanted them to be disciples. So I have so much respect for how he did that. Of course, this must begin with reaching out to unbelievers with the good news that, and you're going to see this un, un, underlined a number of times in the slides as we go through that, uh, Christ died for their sins and rose from the dead. That is really kind of in a one little phrase, it's kind of the core of the good news message. Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. So that's, but that's, it has to, you can't make a disciple. If somebody's an unbeliever, they can't be a disciple until they get saved. Amen? Amen. They have to get saved first, but it doesn't end there. Uh, once saved, they need to start learning and growing in the Christian way of life, which is what we were just talking about. Yes? What do you do when you can't get past step one? They don't believe it. And you just tell them, well, somebody's got to go to hell. You know. <laughs> 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 let, 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 me re, let me repeat that for the rest of you if you didn't hear it. Yes. <laughs> Paula. Paula. Paul said, what do you do if you can't get past step one? I've got to recover from that a little bit. What do, you do? what do you do if you can't get past step one? What if they, what if they don't believe in Jesus? Do you say to him, well, somebody's go to hell. It might as well be you. Somebody's got to go to hell. It might as well be you. Um, uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say, I w- <laughs> although that might be effective with some people, but... but but I, I personally, I would, tell, I, would, I, would just, I would just tell them, well, I'm, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for you because uh, that means that they're not ready yet, you know, because we know the Father has to draw and the Spirit has to convict and all of that has to take place. And so it probably means they're not ready yet. Their heart is not ready yet. Yes, sir. Well, that, okay, that's a great point. So Doug's talking about how uh, Paul, in his teaching, he would build the whole foundation. And so what you, but not only that, he would build a foundation that would teach about who God is, who Jesus Christ is, and he would then, that would, that would bring into view the need for Christ and so on and so forth, right? He would build that foundation. Well, there, I'll say two things. First of all, not only that, you'll read about that in the book of Acts. Look at a lot of times when, when Peter was talking about how he went back and he was basically starting from the beginning, and like building the whole idea to get to the whole thing. Uh, and then they, he would get to the point, this Jesus whom you crucified. You know, that's what he would get to that. Uh, and, 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 that's, and then so did, I believe, Jesus did kind of a similar thing on the road to Emmaus. When he was walking along with them, he was talking about all these Old Testament scriptures that basically were talking about him, right? It was all pointing to him. There's a, there was an organization, Good Seed. I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but good see, but they, they actually published some really good books uh, uh, and so on, and, and different things like you, they have, a, they have a, a different things you can buy, like a lamb, you can see a lamb and how it had to be slaughtered and all, as a type of Christ and so on. But one of their things about that's fundamental about it, Doug, that fits right into what you're talking about is their whole approach is that's how you give the gospel is you start from the beginning, God as a creator and so on, and you go all the way and you build that whole foundation to get to that whole point, Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to be a relationship that you have with someone yes. that's going to continue. Yes. It may be years. Yes. As long as the Lord still has a plan for them to bloom, they're still going to be here. When we see the earth is created, yes. like we see how precious life and death, how quick that can happen. Right. But a lot of times it can take years, and as long as you can somehow continue a relationship with people, yes. because sometimes it has to grow. Yes. 100%. And, and 100%. And the whole Bible verse is to give an answer for the hope that, we li- that lies in you. And people have to see that hope. Correct. Yeah, so 100% agree with you. And in fact, that is exactly the approach of Evantel that we're going to learn here is that it's not a one and done. It, and and I, what, just a second, I'll get, I'll get to your question. So um, it's absolutely important was just what was just talked about, the idea that we have to, we have to, just to repeat it to all you, we have to build that relationship. It might take years. We have an urgency because we know we don't know how long somebody's going to live. We don't know how long it's going to be. It could be tomorrow. The rapture could happen, so on and so forth. But the process of giving the gospel often takes 
a long time. And I will give you an example of that. Pastor Ralph Braun, who's with the Lord now, he, he had this approach. When he, when he went up into the town up in Kansas where he was living, he, he went to the local coffee shop. I've told you about this before. He went to the local coffee shop. And there were a bunch of guys sitting around talking about what a bunch of guys talking about, talk about, right? All the stuff they would talk about. And he joined their little group at the coffee shop, and he talked about the same sorts of, sorts of things, fishing, working on cars, doing ranching, farming, all this kind of stuff. And he waited until he'd gone to the coffee shop a number of times and sort of built some rapport with these people. And then he brought up spiritual things. And when he brought up spiritual things, of course, there were at least a few of them that were like, ah, <laughs> don't want to talk about that stuff, you know, I don't want to get into all of that. Well, long story short, he eventually got around to conversations that were spiritual, gave him the gospel. A bunch of these people got saved. That coffee shop meeting that was originally about cars and weather and women and whatever else it was about became a Bible study because these guys got saved and then they were having a Bible study at the coffee shop. And so it took a long time to, to nurture and develop those relationships so that he would have those opportunities to give the gospel. And it fits 100% into the Evantel methodology of doing this. You don't, just, you don't just walk up to somebody and say, do you know Jesus? Well, if you don't, you know, I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, that might work, but a lot of times it doesn't work that way. A lot of times it's a relationship that has to be built. Yes. Right. And a lot of times God does. A lot of times God does direct us to certain people who right. we need to be with. That's right. Years. Yeah. And, and my point here, like y'all said, you can't just speak because they don't believe right away. You can't just say, "Okay, well, we have to do this." Yeah. We have to see it in us and know that we're not gonna. We're the real deal, and and we're not going to just uh, back away. And it's even more important the way you live. Yep. Oh, you have, they have to see Christ in you. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, otherwise it's hypocritical and they won't, they won't believe anyway, right? It needs right. to be a reality. That actual living, we talked, about it at, we talked about it at the wedding, right? They're in the service. This has to be made real by actual living. You know, that's what people need to see. Angie said, talking about Billy Graham's father, too, what a privilege he had. Yeah. Of course it was a responsibility, but he put, he put it into, it's a responsibility, but we, if you put it in the Lord's hands, then it's not a burden you can't bear, right? I mean, if you, if, you try to, if you try to do it on your own, it becomes a burden you can't bear, but if you, if you allow the Lord to be the one that's doing it, yes, sir? If you can make the connection between gospel and carburetors, <laughs> you can you know the gospel well enough to make the connection. Uh, we'll talk about that later, I guess. <laughs> The gospel and carburetors. I've never heard that one before. Let, before. Before I go on, I see some additional hands. One thing I will say, what Paula was talking about, you know, we kind of chuckled about it, but in reality, I know of a, a specific example where that actually worked. And what I'm getting at is, but, but, but it's actually both, right? A relationship had been building and developing, and uh, the individual had been given the gospel to someone else over a period of time, and the uh, individual was pretty firm and hard-headed in his rejection. And this is, this is uh, Doug Clark, actually, and Dan. And he actually looked at, he looked at, Doug Clark actually looked at Dan and said, okay, fine, just go to hell then. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, honestly, he, he hit him with a brick over the head, right, is what he did. It was a wake-up moment for him, actually. But there had been a relationship already developed before that happened. You know, he's fine. Look, I'm telling you the truth. If you don't want to believe it, go to hell. That's what you're going to do is go to hell, you know. So that's what he said to him. So it can be effective. I don't know who raised their hand first. So. <laughs> yeah, you might be planting a seed. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to keep planting those little seeds. And we're not, we, might not, we might not be the one who, who leads them to Christ. And that's okay. I'm, I hope you're okay with that. But still, you need to be a witness. That's what this is all about is witnessing. We need to be a witness to everyone along the way. Yes. Yeah. Right. 
right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, see, it, prayer is prayer is essential in this, and we're going to talk about that. By the way, the Holy Spirit brings it to your mind when you're in a situation like that, and you're talking, and all of a sudden verses are coming to mind, and usually you're thinking, "How did I remember that verse?" It's the Holy Spirit working in you, bringing those things to mind. But I'll say this: so prayer is hugely important. We're going to talk about that in this study. It is in, the, in, in a great book called True Evangelism. Uh, it, it, it is emphasized beyond what you can imagine, the idea of prayer being an important part of witnessing. It's huge because until God has worked in the heart, there's, you're, you're basically throwing pearls before swine. So, but beyond all that, what you're talking about, if this person you were, you were talking about uh, that you're nurturing a relationship with, if they're already a born-again believer, then you're actually in the process of taking a baby believer and... Yeah. But see, what you're, but see, what you're doing, though, Laura, what you're doing is you're actually helping this person to be a disciple, right? They're, they were in a form of Christianity that was not true biblical Christianity. Right. 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 But see, you're, but see you are now being a witness not to... See, we all often think of witnessing strictly to be a witness to an unbeliever. We need to understand witnessing goes beyond that. You're having an opportunity to be a witness to a baby believer who needs to understand what the Christian way of life is really all about and what it means to be a disciple. And that's just as important as witnessing to an unbeliever because how many baby believers are there walking around right now who don't know anything about God or, or His Word or anything, right? It's very important to help them in their journey to become a disciple. Yeah, that, so it's fascinating, actually. If you have an opportunity, you know you're witnessing to a Jew believer, then you might want to like, feel them out to where they stand. Well, that's true of everybody. That's yeah. true of everybody. Yeah. What, what Paul is talking about, which is astounding if you think about it, most people probably don't recognize this. If you have an opportunity to witness to somebody who's Jewish by birth, don't assume that they believe in God. Yeah. Most Jews don't. Most Jews are secular Jews. They actually, they actually don't believe in God. They don't adhere to the, to the uh, Hebrew scriptures. They're, all, they're, just, they're just going along like a lot of people do. Like, think of, you can think about it this way. A lot of people who are in America, they might, they might you know, have a, a, some sort of egg hunt on Easter, and they give presents on Christmas, and they do that sort of thing. But they're really not Christians at all. Uh, they're unbelievers. Well, Jew, you might have Jews who follow along with some of the holy days that the Jews do and that kind of thing, but they're actually secular Jews. So who, and she said, if you're witnessing to a Jew, first find out where they stand with regard to all of that. Well, that's true of everybody, and we'll get to that too. You got to find out where someone is because you got to witness to them where they are, right? You have to witness to them where they are. All right, let's talk about how the mission is defined. We're going we're gonna to get to our scripture of the week here shortly. So Jesus, first of all, he defined the mission in Acts 1.8. Uh, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Now, why was that significant? Because first of all, a lot of them had this idea, you know, this is where Jesus is. This is where we're supposed to be. This is what we're... And the idea of going out and spreading the gospel to even the remotest parts of the earth was not a concept that they really, really latched on to. They were, they were fine with where they were. So first of all, the goal to be his witnesses, obviously by telling others about him and inviting them to respond. You can't force anybody to believe. God doesn't even force people to believe. 
That's the thing we got to remember. If God's not forcing them to believe, then should we try to force them to believe? I don't think so. We tell them about him and we invite others to respond. The preparation, the Holy Spirit equips us to carry out this mission. You notice that part? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the Holy Spirit's the one who equips us to be able to carry this out. It goes back to what we were talking about, that burden, right? That responsibility. Well, my goodness, I promise you this responsibility for me to come up here and preach the things of the word uh, uh, every Sunday and Wednesday and to be the pastor of this local church, I couldn't bear that responsibility without the strength of God. I couldn't even think about it. I wouldn't be here if I didn't know that I can trust God. I would, I would just, go home and, just go home and go back to bed. Um, what about the extent of it to the ends of the earth, which means as we go, wherever we go, that's what I was talking about before. We are to be his witnesses. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're at work. It doesn't matter if you're at the grocery store. It doesn't matter if you're on travel. Um, we had, you know, some blessings when we took a vacation. Terry and I took a vacation. We were over in Hawaii, and we had an opportunity to be witnesses over there in Hawaii. Everywhere you go, everywhere you go. This one thing to keep in mind is this is a this is a dark, lost world that we live in. It really is. It's a dark, lost world, and we we need not only do we need to shine the light of Christ, they need us to shine the light of Christ. Yes. Yeah, we're being watched all the time, and that's why I've said it many times from this pulpit. You're a witness all the time, whether you like it or not. You're a witness, especially when people know that you're a believer. You're a witness, but are you a good witness or a bad witness? Right, because we can be good witnesses and we can be bad witnesses. But we can witness to unbelievers and believers alike. Laura was talking about that, right? This individual who really needed a, a, a sister in Christ to come along, right, to help that. Uh, hold on a second, just one second. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that too. Uh, Jesse was bringing up Catholicism. One of the challenges in all of this is one of the hardest people, the hardest people to give the gospel to are people that don't think they need to get saved. Either, either they don't think God exists and they don't think they're accountable and they don't think all that. They don't, they don't think they need to get saved in that regard. Or they think they already are, but they're not. Because you can ask them, I promise you, you can ask somebody, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And they can say yes, and you can ask them, okay, well, why is that so? And somebody say, well, because I'm a faithful Catholic. I go to church. I go to Mass every Saturday night. I'm a faithful Catholic. They will not mention the name of Jesus Christ. They, they will not talk. They pray the rosary. They do all those things. But that's not, a, that's not salvation, is it? Hold on one second. Yes. 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 So, yes, absolutely, as, a, as, as the privilege and the blessing that he's given you to have this opportunity to, this, to be able to talk to this person about. And you've learned, you learn a lot in the process as well, don't you? You sure do. You learn a lot in the process. But you see, what you, what you had happen is an open door, right? That was that open door when this person came along and you had an open door. And that's a, it's an amazing blessing. We should seize upon that. Yes, Sandra. Yes, Is that right? that's part of what happens, right? That they baptize them, and at that point, they're saved, right? Well, the rest of your life, you try to be good yeah, saved. yeah, yeah. So that's part of what happens in the Catholic Church. But again, that goes back to what I was talking about. One of the problems is they think they're already saved, but they're not. And so, yeah, so you don't know, and that's why. That's why. I, even though I don't know if it was Catholicism, honestly, probably given that he's German, it was probably Lutheran. Uh, but uh, Ber- I've given the example of Bernhard Langer who called himself a Christian. He thought he was fine. He thought he was saved and all of that. And then he went to a Bible class and the person talked about being born again. He's like, what is that? He, he never had er- heard about being born again. I've heard Lutherans say that they never learned about how to become yeah. a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's, that, so there's a lot to that. Something got lost in translation. Yeah. That's, that happens. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Dependence. Yeah. They, 
But again, that's part of, you pray the rosary, you do the penance, you do all the different things, right? That's what you're doing. And there's, the, there's never a message in there about believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's all about works. But they don't think they need to be saved. That's the whole thing. That's one of the biggest challenges. Yes. I'm under the impression that uh, you cannot not believe. You can believe in something. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Everybody believes in something. The question is, are they, what, what are the merits of the object of their faith? Right? I mean, you know, I, I talk about the example I talk about the example of the bridge. You know, here I am, I'm standing here, and there's a footbridge for me to walk across a canyon. Uh, well, I believe that the bridge is going to hold me up, and I'm going to be able to walk across the canyon. Well, if I get halfway and the bridge collapses, well, what were the merits of the object of my faith? Not very good, was it? That bridge was not able to save me from falling in the canyon. Everybody believes in something, but there's only one thing you can believe in that's going to save you, and that's Jesus Christ. That's one thing. All the rest of it, you can believe in all sorts of other things, but those other things can't save you, right? That's the key. But you're right. Everybody believes in something. Yes? Oh, interesting. Okay. Interesting. So at the Lutheran church, the idea is if you're there, if you're attending the services, then, well, you must be a believer. You must be. They don't even bother to give the gospel. What, you, want to, you, don't want to be on the, you don't want to be on either side, of the, either side of this. I'm getting ready to give you two sides. One side is that in, one side is that in, a, in, a, in a place like this where you come to church, you never hear the gospel, right? You never hear it because you're all believers. You guys are all believers. I'm just going to tell you about the Christian way of life. I don't need to give you the gospel. First of all, I, I need to hear the gospel all the time personally. I need to hear it all the time. Not so I can get saved, so I can remember my Savior and what He did for me on the cross. But the other flip side of it is there's churches where all they ever hear is the gospel. Every single time you go to church, you hear the gospel. Well, I love the gospel, but don't you need something beyond the gospel? I think you do. So, but churches like that, that's problematic. If, if you never hear the gospel, then where are you going to hear? I, I'm, I need to be evangelizing from the pulpit, don't I? Don't I need to be sharing the message from the pulpit? I think so. Yes. Can I tell this real short story? I went on a mission trip to Brazil, and they prepared us with tools to use because people can't speak Portuguese. We did. One of the tools was a makeshift record player. It's a little cardboard box that you put this little record on. It would take a pencil like this, and you could write pencil in your place. So I go, I'm in the hotel room getting ready to go to meet the the guy, the pastor that was the one that made them. I'm running late and start to open my door and the two um, housekeepers were in the hall and one is already a Christian and she said, she said, I, what needed witness to this, this other housekeeper that was with her? And I'm, I can't, I don't have time is what I'm thinking. <laughs> so, and then my pastor was in the room right next door and he cracked the door open. He handed me one of those record players and gave me this quirky grin and shut the door and left me on my own with the record player. <laughs> and I gave it to the to the lady who was a Christian and she sat down there and she did like this and she then she witnessed to the other lady and the lady was saved right there. Well, there you go. That was an opportunity there. So the example she gave, and by the way, there's a couple of things we can learn from the example she gave of a, of a mission trip to Brazil where they speak Portuguese. Is first of all, there's all kinds of tools that can be part of evangelism, right? There's all kinds of things. If you think about the Good News Club, they have the, the little deal with the different colors on it, right? And you can actually show sin, and you can show salvation. You can show all sorts of things through the colors on that. There's all tools. Tools are not bad. Tools can be used as part of evangelism. This was something where you didn't speak the Portuguese language, so you had something that, would, that you could use to help do that. But the other thing you can learn from that lesson, by the way, and by the way, these shoe boxes, that's a tool for evangelism. That's a tool for evangelism. Um, the other part of this is we have these thoughts. I don't have time. I can't do it. I don't speak Portuguese. You have all these reasons why that it won't be. And that's, we're going to get into that. There's a, we can, we have, we can have, I promise you, I'm going to name some excuses. You probably have more. We can, we can all come up with excuses as to why we're not going to give somebody the gospel. But the, the bottom line is that was an open door. That was an open door and you needed to recognize it. Finally. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, you, you brought that up. Everybody believes in something. Don's bringing up that atheism, they have their very uh, deep-seated beliefs. That's why there's an incredible book out there, I Do Not Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It's a, an incredible book because what it does is if they'll read it, they'll come to realize they have all sorts of faith 
systems that they believe in. They have placed faith in all sorts of things. Because, I mean, give me, let me give you examples. Somebody comes out with some scientific report about blah, 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 whatever it is. People believe it. Did they do the science? Did they actually do the experiments? Did they actually do whatever it is? No. They just believe what they read in a scientific report. That's faith. That's faith. Yes, sir. I've read that uh, people only make one or two, maybe three important decisions in their life. Yeah. And if they ever make a mistake with that, they never can make another decision. Well, I, you know, I, 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 let me think about that a second. You've read that people make only maybe, what, three or four, two or three or four major decisions in their lives. Uh, but if, and if they go along the wrong path that basically they're not going to ever make another decision kind of thing. Well, I, I'm, I'm have to think about that in terms of my own life. I've make, I've made a number of decisions. My, obviously the one that was the most important one was placing my faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, I'll have to chew on that one. Uh, but, but, but this is a major decision. The important thing about what you're saying is this is a major decision. Don't you agree? This is a major decision. Hands down, the most important decision anybody's ever going to make in their lives uh, and so is it something that we, is it something that we should uh, treat as a minor thing? No, it's a major decision for, in their lives. And people only make, you know, a handful. Yes. Yeah, that's a good example. People, yeah. Everybody has faith in the example that was given, right? Uh, Rebecca gave the example of uh, going to the grocery store. You have faith that the food you're buying and you're taking home is not going to kill you. Uh, I'll go even beyond that. You're driving down the road. You've got a green light. You have faith that a car is not going to run the red light and slam into you and kill you. You're taking it on faith. Is there any, do you have any evidence that that's not going to happen? And you don't. Just because it didn't happen the last however many times you've gone through an intersection doesn't mean it's not going to happen this time. It's a function of faith. Everybody believes in something. Going back to what Jim said, everybody believes in something. Yes. Going back to what Jim said, uh, some of our, uh, a couple of colleagues were from work that didn't want to make major decisions because they said I already failed once or twice. But yeah. They confidence in anything they do. I got you. So you, in terms of what Jim was saying, so the idea of the, if you've made major decisions in your life and they've turned out to be disasters, then you become leery of making another major decision in your life. And this is certainly a major decision, but uh, it's one of those things where you have to... It if, turns it into fear. Yeah, it becomes, that's right. It becomes, it becomes a fear factor. That's exactly right. Finally, we're going to close with David here because we need to get to our scripture of the week. His last question. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there is man's concept of Christianity and then there's God's concept. And unfortunately, you're right. God's concept is a relationship. And like I said, so first of all, so there's the, there is the pharisaical, pharisaical ideas, right? But even beyond that, some people would view, if you, for instance, I'm a pastor and a lot of people know that I'm a pastor. And some people would have it in their mind. And I'm not talking about just uh, anybody. I'm talking about even it's happened in, even within people in this, in this church that I'm not going to ever do anything sinful. You are badly mistaken. <laughs> you are badly mistaken. I am a sinner saved by grace. Now, is my goal to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and to be pleasing in His sight and to not fall into sin? That is my goal. But if you expect me, and that's what, that's what I'm going back to, the man's idea and, and God's idea. God, God has saved me, right? God has saved me. He's provided my Savior not only for my eternal uh, salvation, but for my day-to-day -day struggle with sin. There are those who view Christians as if they ever do anything wrong, they look at them immediately as a hypocrite. 
you're just a hypocrite. You know, you say you're a Christian, but then look, you did this. That's man's definition of Christianity. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, I'm cautious about that because I've heard, you know, um, heart faith versus, you know, mind. But the, the, but the truth of the matter is if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're saved. It's that simple. And, it, and, and that's, that's that it, I don't, so I don't, I don't get too deep into that sort of thing. But what's important is, what's important is we're going to talk about all those issues of individuals who need to be helped in terms of understanding that they're not saved even if they think they are. That's a big deal. We're going to talk about that. One final one. Yeah, yeah. That's a big deal, right? So that's that whole thing I was talking about. So there's the, that's the sullying of the witness, right? Those who, who are, even, they, might, they are Christians in many cases, right? They, these people are Christians, but then they've, then they've done something. They've done something that sullied their witness. And then, I, I believe me when I tell you, that's one of Satan's tools. He will latch onto that, and everybody that knows about it, that's going to be their excuse. They're gonna say, they don't, again, like you said, they don't have a problem with God whatsoever. Their problem was with Christians, and the fact that they view them as hypocrites, right? And so that just continually becomes a problem. That's why we all need to be careful about our witness. But again, it goes back to man's definition of Christianity in a way because am I perfect? No, but I believe in the one who is, Jesus Christ himself. And am I, am I endeavoring to mature in the faith? Am I endeavoring, again, to reach the point where uh, I'm able to walk in a manner worthy and be pleasing in his sight? Absolutely, but I'm still going to stumble. All of us do. I promise you, you will not finish today without committing a sin of some kind. It's going to happen. We all, we all fall into sin from time to time. But there are those... Yeah, one last thing. We got <laughs> one last... Well, how many last things have we had? <laughs> Hold on. How many, that's like if you look at the Bible, how many last trumpets are there? There are a bunch of last trumpets, actually. Yes. Well, I just have to say that everybody's looking at you. Yes. Whether they're a Christian or whether they're a non-Christian. Yes. Yeah, well, that's true, and we're, we're supposed to be transformed, right? We're supposed to be transformed. Everybody's watching, as, as, as you, Mary's pointing out, the idea that we're going to have we, unbelievers and believers alike watching yeah, us, right? Yeah. They're afraid to step out again because they might flub again. But see, in reality, so you ever, if you flub, right, if you, may, if, you, if you make some kind of an error, you, may, you, you flub in some kind of a way, yeah, if you go back into hiding, that doesn't do anything at all, right? You're not, you're not accomplishing anything by that. In reality, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, a true Christian, a believer, and you do stumble, and then you use that to show people the forgiveness of God, now you're showing them grace. Now you're showing them what Christ did for you on the cross. Yes, I failed, but God didn't. In fact, not only did God not fail, he succeeded mightily through what happened on the cross. And so you can use a flub as a witness, actually. You can use it as a witness, and you should. I mean, we all stumble. None of us are perfect. Well, maybe one or two of you, but m <laughs> most of us, most of us are not perfect. All right, we're going to get to our scripture of the week. We made good progress on that. We're going to get to evangelism as a privilege next time. It's interesting. This is, I, I like that this is stirring up conversation. There's a lot to be said about this. It's an important part of the Christian walk. We are supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. So we should, we should be uh, embracing this privilege. We'll do this quickly because we're already at the top of the hour. Let's go ahead and all read this together. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All right, it goes on to kind of give us an idea. Oh, I didn't know that was on the screen. Thank you, Windows.
Um, it goes on to kind of help us understand the, what the concept of grieving the Holy Spirit is in terms of verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, which we just talked about, and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So this idea of this certain, this certainly what's described in verses 31 and 32 are things that grieve the Holy Spirit of God. But I can make a clear argument from Scripture that every time you sin, you grieve the Holy Spirit. Every time you stumble into sin, you grieve the Holy Spirit of God. This is an admonition not to do that uh, again. We have struggles from time to time where we do stumble into sin. The best answer of all, as you know, is to keep a short account, recognize your sin, confess it, get back into fellowship, get back into the right walk with the Lord, walking in the light as He is in the light. But this is an admonition that that gives us a little picture of what happens when we do stumble into sin. The Holy Spirit is grieved. Again, anthropopathism, right? We talked about the anger of the Lord and how that's an anthropopathism. This is a, an emotion, a, a thing that we understand is being grieved, right? We understand grief. We've experienced grief. And so it helps us, it paints a picture for us of what happens when we sin. The Holy Spirit is grieved. Again, it's an anthropopathism, but it kind of gives us an idea. He goes through, it's, it's grieving to the Holy Spirit for us to fall into sin, God does not want us to stumble into sin. So we want to try not to do that. That's what this is saying. Do not do that. Uh, And if you get into it, it's actually uh, even emphasizing the idea of stop stop doing that. That's really, it really is. It's kind of saying stop doing that uh, to the Holy Spirit. But then it goes on. So that's important in terms of sin. Then it goes on to speak about by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, I've done teaching on this before, but the idea of a seal is extremely important. And I'm going to give you some various aspects of it that are all pertinent to this verse and this description. You have been sealed by God, not just by any old thing, by God himself. First thing I'm going to tell you that a seal gives you is the idea of ownership. That's going to sound funny when I say that, but it's almost like the picture of when somebody brands their cattle. They're marking that. This is mine. So when you get sealed by the Holy Spirit, God is saying, mine. This one's mine, right? So that's one of the first aspects. Also, when you seal something up, there's the idea of not being tampered with, right? Right? You can almost think of it in terms of how they do the products that you buy from the grocery store that have that tamper-proof thing on there, right? So when you get it home and you open it up, we actually had something the other day, believe it or not, that when we opened up, it was some peanut butter. We opened it up, the little thing had already been popped on it. We threw it in the trash. You know, it looked fine, but you just don't know at that point, right? So that's the idea of a seal too. A lot of times, for example, if... uh, if, if some, it, it also has the idea of not, you know, not to tamper with. So that's a message to Satan. Don't tamper with this, right? This is mine. Don't tamper with it. That's the nature of the seal. But also the idea of something being delivered all the way to the end without it being messed with at all, right? And it, it arrives as it's supposed to, to the end result. If I'm a king, I'm, uh, here we, we're putting ourselves in, in, a, in a monarchy situation. I'm a king. I have a document. I need it to be, to be delivered over to somebody else, a king over there. I take that document. It gets rolled up. Wax is put on there. I put my signet ring on it. I seal it. It, all, it prevents it from being tampered with, right? It gets to the other side untampered with. But not only that, when, when the king opens that document, he knows this is actually the real deal. It also is validating in terms of this is the real deal, right? So the idea of ownership, the idea that you don't get tampered, the idea that this is the real deal, right? This is, this is exactly what I'm supposed to have here. So all of that is entailed, and I could go into more, more information than that, but the idea of us being sealed, what that means is that you cannot, you cannot not arrive the way you're supposed to at the day of redemption, So when you talk about that, the idea is that we are redeemed, we are saved, 
And that seal that God puts upon us keeps us from being unsaved. Those who think that you can lose your salvation don't understand the seal. They don't understand what it means to be sealed by God. You are saved. He has sealed you. You will arrive as you should at the day of redemption. You will go to heaven. You will spend all of eternity with God. The seal ensures that. Does that make sense? You guys tracking me on that? All right. I could talk more about that, but we're already at the top of the hour, so we're going to stop right there and go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to begin talking about witnessing, and I'm excited that a lot of people have a lot to say about it. It is an important aspect of our lives. We have uh, been given that as a commission. We've been given that as an ambassadorship to be representatives of Christ on this earth. We need to take these things seriously. Is it always easy? No, but it's something we need to become more comfortable with. It's something that we need to learn to do when those doors open. You can save people without us, but you've given us this blessing, this opportunity to be your representatives here on this earth, this opportunity to give the gospel to those who need to hear it. That's one of the things we have to remember, Father, is that we, the, this world needs to hear that message. And you've given us that blessing of being able to deliver the message about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. We thank you for the scripture of the week, the idea that we've been sealed up, the idea that you've protected us, that we can't be tampered with. Satan can't steal us away. He can't pull us out of your hand. It can't be done. We have been sealed. And that's a powerful statement. But Father, we also get in that verse the idea of grieving the Holy Spirit, and we don't want to do that. So help us. Give us strength. Help us to walk in a manner that is worthy. Help us to avoid stumbling into sin. And when we do, help us to get back into fellowship immediately, back into the right walk, walking in the light as he is in the light. But we thank you for this reminder that when we do sin, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And that's not something we want to do. When we, and we need to remember that every single sin we commit, even from the quote unquote smallest ones to the greatest ones, every sin we commit was enough to put Jesus on the cross. We have to remember how utterly sinful sin is. And thank you for those reminders today. We thank you for all of this in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen.